I just love the series. So congratulations. I really Thank enjoyed you. the experience of uh, watching those eight episodes. Um, Thanks so much. Because we haven't spoken before, I wondered if you'd mind um, just taking me back um, a little bit to how the performer and you kind of first manifested. Were you sort of in school plays or how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, so it's really interesting. I, I think um, tracing it back, I think I've... Uh... I, I was a bit of a weird kid. I think it was quite hard to cast me growing up because uh, always presented quite masculinely, but you know, identified as a, as a girl at that point. And so I don't think anyone really knew how to cast me at the, uh, in school plays and things, but I just played so many imaginary games with my friends um, up until probably the age of 17, 18. And I think that was just like the root of my obsession with just playing pretend and yeah acting feels like it's an extension of that really what, what kind of games were you playing with your friends <laughs> honestly just whatever we could come up with we just I had a great friend actually specifically one friend who loved coming up with like the story of it and she would just throw things at us it would just be like improv games and then I would just uh take it as 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 I could and be very yes and and then just we would just be running about in, in parks and the woods with sticks and, you know, the kind of stuff that you do as a kid. But I was doing it kind of almost into adulthood. Well, and I mean, you're still doing it to a degree because, I mean, imagination is such a key part of acting. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Whether it's, uh, you know, a three-headed dog or whatever you might have to. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, and you grew up in, in London, is that is that right? Yep. Yeah, London born and bred, yeah. So, and were you um, taken to the theatre when you were a young person was that something that um sort of drew, drew you into acting also yeah I think my dad also like went to school with a bunch of people who became actors and and we would go sometimes see uh some of their shows so it was sort of around but I think I like um I don't know I just never thought that it would be something that I was allowed to do I think probably because of what I said like I don't think I ever saw myself in those roles it was something that I loved the concept of and I'd put on these plays with my friends and things but yeah I don't think I ever saw myself in that space and at what point did you start to think oh maybe I could have a career in this yeah I think well I did this um short course that um this amazing charity gendered intelligence um ran with a um uh, in collaboration with the Central School of Speech and Drama and they just did every Saturday for 10 weeks and I didn't actually get on the course but someone dropped out luckily and I uh, uh, yeah I got to just be part of this training and they brought in people to see people and auditions and things and I got an episode of Casualty through that course and uh, and I was like oh okay well uh, yeah uh, I'm apparently castable and people watching this uh, who maybe don't don't live in the UK and wouldn't know about Casualty, I mean, some of the most recognisable actors in the world have had a, you know, done a Casualty episode. I think definitely Kate Winslet is uh, someone yeah. that has a Casualty episode. But if, if you scroll right back on um, any uh, British actor's IMDb page, you'll probably see Casualty there. It does feel like it's the training ground for, for all actors, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so you you um so you were saying you you didn't initially get on the course, but then when someone dropped out, you did do get on the course, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I and mean, there's so many reasons I shouldn't have got that role. Actually, I I didn't get on the course, and then I missed the audition, and then the audition was during school time. But I I managed to have, I had two free periods that day. It was just fateful, honestly, fateful. And how old were you when you did Casualty then? I think I was maybe 15 when I got cast and 16 when I did the job. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, there were, that is a, a, a great start. And as I say, you've, you know, in some following in some um, pretty amazing footsteps <laughs> by doing that. <Yeah. laughs> um, and then did, did you go on to do um, a full acting uh, training program? Yeah. I actually didn't. I I had uh, the like luck of my school had amazing kind of uh plays and things um they just really loved putting in the uh the time and effort to to supporting um theater at my school and um I got in with that um but I I never ended up doing any kind of uh formal training I think because of casualty I got an, uh, an agent and then I was sort of doing bits and pieces here and there and uh my agent was like you can absolutely go train um 
but you could also do this play here or do this job here and and I just tried doing that instead and I've been making my way through ever since yeah and of course you're you're honing your craft with each new job I'm, I'm sure yeah. as well so absolutely yeah part of it too so let's talk about uh chaos which um I've been lucky enough to watch the in entire uh series so far um, so okay. what were your initial thoughts uh when chaos was first mentioned to you oh honestly I remember the kind of um press release of the original I think it, I can't even remember when it was it might have been 2018 2019 when they first announced that Charlie Cavell was going to be adapting Greek myths into a new tv series of Netflix and pretty much every single one of my friends sent me the link they were like you have to do this and I was like I mean <laughs> imagine they wrote a part for me imagine the, how crazy would that be and then a, a couple of well 2020 I got through the audition and it was a Greek myth that I have been obsessed with since I was a kid um and it was you know a, a, they sort of described it as a lead and I was like oh no, I'm going to be way too invested in this. This is so scary. And um, yeah, and then the whole process took a, a lot longer to to get to, but eventually I think it was the yeah beginning of 2022, I finally got the call uh, that I, I got the role and I just cried. It was <laughs> insane. Yeah, oh, that's amazing though, to, to be so excited just when you hear about the project and then to it, you know, Honestly, again, like fate feels like a really big part of this whole process. I'm still waiting for someone to to tell me it's all a joke and to, yeah, to pull the rug from underneath me, honestly. And how about when you got to read the uh, the full script? What was your sort of reaction then as you got into more of uh, Charlie's take on uh, yeah. Greek mythology? Yeah. Honestly, every scene I was like more and more obsessed. It was like they do this amazing thing where they write in the music that they kind of were inspired by or they they can imagine underscoring the scene and actually a lot of that music has remained in the show which is incredible I think you'll agree like music is such an integral part of the tone of the show so they made uh, this this playlist that I was listening to while I was reading the scripts and it just was so all-encompassing cinematic tonally just so strong and so dark but witty but like beautiful and I was like crying and laughing it was insane I was like I've never had that visceral response to a script before yeah actually I should tell people they should have their remotes ready as an episode is coming towards an end because you don't want um you know to skip to the next episode you want to listen to the the songs because <laughs> brilliant yeah. music throughout but there's a lot of great like end credit music too <laughs> absolutely you definitely I think Shazam should be like uh, on like prepared for everyone yes. <laughs> And and what was um Kineas like as a character to inhabit? It felt so natural. I think that I again feel so blessed because not only to have the context of this show and, and all the amazing people involved, but like to have a character that just really, really felt like me. It just felt really like a big privilege. And I think especially because it feels like I've done bits and pieces of work, but this definitely felt like the mammoth of like work that I've done before and that can be terrifying but it felt like this character was someone I really understood and really empathized with and that was yeah just beautiful and I think we see far too little uh transmasculine representation on screen mm. really anywhere so particularly to have it on such a ma massive platform um like Netflix and such a big show so what does that aspect of um of this whole project mean to you exactly what you described I think that like I think as I say growing up I didn't see myself in these spaces and I think that that just makes you unable to imagine yourself as as any of these sorts of things and I think even like I was describing this to a friend I think we underestimate the psychological aspect of that because you have all these narratives in your everyday life. You have your romance narrative, your work narrative, your friendship narrative, all these kind of blueprints that we have. And when you have never seen yourself in that space, 
it can be hard to imagine that you would ever exist in that space. I think that was a big thing I struggled with, with like a romantic narrative. And uh, and and definitely, I think with uh, Canaeus's like heroic narrative, he's he's such a um, understated hero, I think. And I think that I find it really empowering to have someone just so strong in his identity. And that's not something that he ever struggles with throughout the series. Um, he's just he knows who he is, but he's and, and and it's so tied in with his his character, but he's also just a very kind hearted hero. And I think that's, yeah, as you say, not something that we see with trans masculine representation. And let's talk about some of your co-stars. So Aurora, who plays uh, Riddy, you have some wonderful um, scenes with her. What was it like creating that on screen uh, relationship uh, together? It was incredible she is one of those actors that you meet and I think you can agree you see the show and she's just magnetic and I think I have such a privilege throughout all of the cast was that they were so giving and I definitely feel that with Aurora we did a few um uh rehearsals with Georgie the director a bit before we even started the shoot um and then Georgie was like uh actually don't interact um I want to see what it's like to to have you guys really kind of getting to know each other as as you do the the show so I think the uh hopefully it kind of comes across that we have quite a, like a a new bubbling um energy because we were we were really getting to know each other on set in real time um okay. but I really just felt so privileged to get to act alongside her she was so giving and, and talented yeah, yeah, all of that really does, does come across in the in the scenes beautifully. And Debbie Mazar is one of my uh, favorite actors, and she always brings so much to the screen. She brings so much to every project. Uh, yeah, what was she like to uh, share scenes with? So great. She's just iconic, and I think I remember seeing that she was cast as Medusa and being like, "This is going to be amazing." Just every line that she delivers is so dry and witty I think I think someone described her as like a DMV employee and I just think that image of Medusa working at the DMV is uh just incredible um she's yeah she's a wonder and she has some amazing stories about her friendships with the friendship with Madonna it's just like <laughs> um halfway through the, the the set I'll just get some you know uh story about her going to Madonna's birthday party I'll be like okay this is this is my life. I have one degree of separation with Madonna now. Exactly, just one degree so far. So maybe, yeah, we forget. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Touching on, um, yeah, the way that Medusa um, kind of goes about her business um, in the underworld. But yeah, could you give us a, a bit of an insight into uh, Charlie's vision of the underworld? And yeah, I mean, I think the underworld is such an incredible vision. I think. I, I might be a bit biased, but it is kind of my favorite world of the three worlds I guess we get to see. It was just such an inspired um, visual take, but also um, tonal take. I think you can really tell that the underworld is, it's got this stiltedness and this dry, dark, very, it's hard to describe, but I think it's 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 a very unique space, and I think I feel very privileged that I get to do most of all, all my bits in there, um, having been dead for ten years. Um, <laughs> but it's got this, yeah, it's kind of absurdism that really comes with death, and I think that Charlie's writing just really lends itself to that. Yes, and I say it's such a great contrast to the other two worlds as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the um, vibrancy of them. And talking about co-stars, we have to mention um, your canine uh, co-star. So, uh, was it a was it a tennis ball, or were you in the really never <laughs> with the CGI yeah. so amazing these days? Did, did you actually have a dog there? Or... Yeah. So I was really wondering what it was going to be before uh, beforehand, just having read the the scripts, and um, I turned up, and it was a beautiful, beautiful pointer, Spanish pointer. Um, it only responded to Spanish commands. Um, uh, and we we became very good friends, um, but it was a little bit stressful having to speak in Spanish up until, you know, they say action and then suddenly all in English and uh, you're, there was no tennis balls, there was just the dog um, and the amazing ma magic that is, you know, BFX um, specialists were doing their their magic and I had to kind of distract one head and pretend to scratch another head 
um and just you know speak to two heads that weren't there um and it was a it was a lot to hold in your head but it was just amazing amazing to see so did you actually shoot your scenes in Spain largely yes yeah so it was all in Spain there was a little bit in Italy but almost all in Spain yeah yes and it looks like a really um beautiful location oh yeah some of the, I mean I'm kind of jealous of some of the locations they got to do I mean Poseidon's yacht it looks incredible <laughs> now I'd love to ask you for your, your favorite piece of LGBTQ plus uh culture so it could be um a tv series a film a book a play um music um any kind of culture or a person uh who identifies mm -hmm. as LGBTQ plus so someone or something that's had an impact on you kind of resonated with you over the years yeah, two things spring to mind. I do too. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> um, there's one that I think it just hands down is one of my favorite films ever. Um, is uh, Tomboy by Celine Sciamma. Um, this beautiful French coming of age movie that just kind of encapsulates my experience of being that age, and it's just uh, it's so beautifully shot and acted and it, I think it was probably the first time and maybe the best time, uh, best representation of my experience as, as a queer person growing up. I, I think nothing has come close to that. Um, but also I at probably between the ages of 12 and 18 uh, watched the film Imagine Me and You uh, with uh, Lena Headey and uh, Piper Perabo. Uh, falling in love uh, just probably a million times it was like my teen obsession um and I think it's yeah it started kick-started my obsession with rom-coms but I think it just like yeah it was it was such a not tragic beautiful romance between two women and I was like this feels so special and rare <laughs> I loved it and yeah as as we were talking um before about um representation and you can just imagine um so many people are going to be engaging with chaos in the same way and, and particularly your character uh, I hope so that would be beautiful well uh, Misha thanks so much and uh great chatting with you congratulations again on chaos thank thanks such a lovely chat thank you